Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's live online webinar and book launch for the Beginner's Guide to Astrophotography with author and night sky photographer, Dr. Mike Shaw. My name is Katie Walker. I am the marketing coordinator at Rocky Nook, and I am delighted to be here with you all today. We're going to be getting started in just a minute to give participants some time to join the webinar room. In the meantime, please feel free to share in the chat your name, where you're joining us from, or just say hello to our speaker, Mike. Welcome everyone, if you've just joined us and you're here for our live online webinar and book launch for the Beginner's Guide to Astrophotography, you've come to the right place. We will be getting started in just a minute. While we wait for attendees to enter the webinar room, please feel free to share with us where you're joining us from, your name, and say hello to Mike. All right, we may have some more participants who will be joining us in progress, but we're going to get started. A couple of things to note for those of you who are here. If you have to leave early for whatever reason, we will be emailing all those who registered the recording to this webinar. This webinar recording will also be available to watch on Rocky Nook's public YouTube channel. Whatever burning questions you do have for Mike throughout his webinar, please enter those into the Q&A function as we will be moderating those at the end of Mike's tutorial. For those of you who are unfamiliar to Rocky Nook, we are a small independent publisher local to the Bay Area in California. Rocky Nook was founded in 2006 with the goal of publishing books that would help all level photographers improve their skills to capture those moments that matter. We are very excited to host Mike Shaw as we celebrate his new book, right here, The Beginner's Guide to Astrophotography. Mike's book is currently available in ebook and Kindle format, and the print version is available for pre-order. If you have not yet published Mike's book, you can buy it from Rocky Nook's online store with an amazing discount of 40% off. Uh, that's off the print book, the ebook, or you can buy the bundled edition. And the coupon code, which I will put in the chat, is ASTRO40. We ask that if you buy and read Mike's book, that you leave him a helpful review online as this supports Rocky Nook to keep bringing you the books that we publish and it helps Mike as the author and the photographer. Now to introduce Mike. Mike Shaw is an astrophotographer, teacher, and author of The Beginner's Guide to Astrophotography, published in 2023, Creative Nightscapes, and Time Lapses, published in 2018, and The Complete Guide to Landscape Astrophotography, published in 2017. Mike's field workshops take him and his students around the globe searching for the darkest, clearest skies. He began teaching photography classes in 2010 while working as a physics professor and soon succumbs to the lure of the open road. He quit his job in 2014 and has been enthusiastically teaching night photography ever since. He especially loves being present when people experience, often for their first time in their lives, that human connection with the night sky and the universe that transcends international borders. Mike offers interactive online lessons with Adobe Photoshop Lightroom and helps create the video tutorials for the Planet Pro app. In addition, he provides astronomy training to the U.S. National Park Service, taught night photography and time-lapse classes in the Brian Peterson School for Photography, and led an interactive nightscape star party live weekly on slu.com. He licenses his work through Science Photo Library in London. He is a delegate to the International Dark Sky Association and an active member of the Minnesota Astronomical Society and the Astronomical League. Please join me in welcoming Mike Shaw. Hey, everyone. Thanks, Katie, for that wonderful introduction. And I just wanted to add my 
voice of welcome to everyone who's attending this this afternoon, this evening, this morning, the middle of the night, depending on where you are. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here today, and I think we're just going to go ahead and dive into this. So let's see if I can do this. Uh, there we go. So hopefully you can see. As Katie mentioned, I'm, we're just super thrilled to um, introduce you to the Beginner's Guide to Astrophotography. This has been underway now for about a year and a half, really almost two years from the pro, uh, pro project inception, and couldn't be more excited that it's now about to get into your hands and into your electronic devices. So uh, night falls and it gets dark, stars start to come out. There's an old Persian saying that night hides the world and reveals the universe. Here you can see the glorious central band, the core of our home galaxy, the Milky Way. This is a time-lapse shot from Kanab, Utah, using the general techniques described in the book. And all too soon, our nightly journey comes to an end as we wait for another night. So there are so many things to enjoy viewing through the night sky. This image uh, you'll soon <laughs> appreciate is on the back cover of the book. And thank you to all of you who helped us choose between this image for the back cover and the existing image of the Rho Ophiuchus molecular cloud over the California Eastern Sierra for the front cover of the book. It was about a 50-50 split, but constellations like the Orion that you can see here, Orion the Hunter, and many others are just wonderful astrophotography targets. If you're new to astrophotography, which I suspect many people are, uh, this is one of the greatest places to start. Constellations are relatively easy to find and enjoy. They've got an incredible history, and there is always something in the sky that is kind of fun to uh, check out. Now, everybody's favorite target is the summer Milky Way. Uh, as you can see here, it's the same all over the world, northern, southern hemisphere. Um, this is the classic view, just like we saw in the opening video, opening time lapse, showing the uh, central region, the central band of the Milky Way. And what I want to draw your attention to here in particular, just as we're getting started, is the incredible variety of objects that you can see here in the night sky. I mean, sure, you can see this Milky Way band, but look at it carefully. See if you can make out things that are a little bit bigger than stars, little patches of light and globs and blobs of light that are scattered and distributed throughout the Milky Way. Each one of these is something that our book is going to help you uh, discover and explore with your camera. One of everyone's favorite subjects to photograph, however, is the moon, especially the full moon, as you can see here on the left over White Bear Lake in Minnesota, and even a gibbous moon or just a, a quote unquote regular moon through a cloudy night with a nice moon halo, as you can see here in Death Valley National Park in California. What you can see on the foreground on the right are these notorious salt flats, uh, salt crystals, uh, different types of chloride, you know, borax was, my, or, was produced in this area. And when the uh, the it's it's the lowest point in the United States in the in the continent. So all the water that drains in here doesn't have anywhere to go. It just sits there and evaporates and produces these magnificent salt crystals. Each one of these is about six or eight feet uh, across. You can comfortably sit in the middle of one of these and uh, and have a look around. Now, in addition to the Milky Way and the um, and the full moon, as you can see here, the moon actually has plays a role in a lot of different events. Here is a lunar eclipse. Uh, also from Death Valley, as it turns out, a, a few years ago, that bright object to the right is, in fact, the eclipsed moon. It's, in to it's, a, it's been totally eclipsed. It's deeply immersed in the moon shadow. And because of that, even though it appears bright in this particular, uh, this particular image, it's dark enough, it's dimmed enough that you can actually make out the surrounding stars and even details of the Milky Way. Each one of these photographs, I should warn you, has about a 10 minute story behind it. This one is no, this was a 24 hour trip door to door from, from my home in, uh, in the Twin Cities in Minneapolis. But when I realized where the eclipsed moon was going to be relative to the center of the Milky Way, I just had to go. So I'll tell you that story sometime if we have a chance. But this is a, a lunar eclipse when the moon is in the Earth's shadow. 
But when the Earth is in the moon shadow, of course, we have a total solar eclipse like the one you can see here from Grand Teton National Park in Idaho. This was in 2017. And you probably know that we have a ring of fire. Uh, we just had a, a hybrid eclipse that was an annular eclipse with a total eclipse on the April 20th. And coming up uh, this year in October, we're having an annular eclipse that's going to pass over um, the uh, southwestern United States. I'm going to be in New Mexico. And then, of course, in April, in just under a year from now, on April 8th of 2024, is it, can you believe it's 2024 already? I mean, think about that for a minute. But anyway, a year from now, in 2024, April 8th, we're going to have another total solar eclipse here in the United States that uh, I think uh, many people listening in will be able to enjoy. So mark that on your calendar. And there's a bit in the book about photographing solar eclipses that you might find helpful. Now, of course, one of the other fantastic transcendental uh, experience, this experiences uh, in, at night is the Aurora Borealis or the Aurora Australis, depending on which hemisphere you're in. This is a scene from, again, northern Minnesota in late uh, 2019, I believe it was. And you can see these beautiful shimmering bands of uh, yellow light and pink light, magenta, purple light, depending on the type of oxygen molecular atom and nitrogen molecular atom that is uh, is producing this sort of light. So these are, again, this is a just a, by way of uh, introduction, I want to say this is a... Um, if you're new to this, this would be considered a landscape astrophotography image. It's got, you know, a foreground, which is terrestrial, and an interesting night sky. This is also known as a nightscape image, for those of you familiar with the nightscaper community. In contrast to landscape astrophotography images, we also have what are called deep sky astrophotography images. I want to clearly delineate between those two categories of astrophotography because they're quite different. And this is an example of a deep sky astrophotography image. It shows the, the same uh, region of the sky that's on the front cover of the book. This is the Rho Ophiuchus uh, complex. And it's one of these images, just like so many things in nature. And I'm, I'm, I'm confident that many people on the call or watching this recording are in some way, shape, or form a nature photographer. And it's just like everything else in nature, watching a you know a patch of, of just a patch of uh, of ground or the sky or a, a lake. The more you look at it, the more you see. And it, this is no different. Each one of these objects is is widely spaced in space in the cosmos, and each one of these is of enormous dimensions. You can see in the lower right. Uh, this is I don't know if you can see my mouse, but this is a huge cluster of stars called a globular star cluster. Globular star clusters are ancient, and there's a whole. <laughs> we got to be careful not to go down the rabbit hole here. But anyway, this is a this is a deep sky object showing a variety of different fascinating and colorful uh, objects. This is another really interesting type of object called a planetary nebula. This is a very zoomed in crop. Uh, but again, I should say at the outset that all of the images in the book are captured with a camera. We're not talking about, this book is not about telescope astrophotography, or you don't need a big expensive, you know, equatorial telescope mount to do any of this stuff. This book is really aimed for you, the photographer, um, with a, you know, a normal set of lenses. This particular object, by the way, this little white star at the center is what's left over of the star that produced this, um, this, uh, this image. And as the star got close to the end of its life, it went underwent a process where it sort of blew up in a, in a, in a somewhat controlled way and produced these different uh, uh, colored shells that surround it. In contrast, uh, this is a star nursery. Though I should be careful to say this is not a supernova. So just, this is a planetary nebulous for the, astronomer, for the astronomers in the audience. This is a star nursery. This is a glowing pink cloud of interstellar hydro ionized hydrogen gas, hydrogen molecules. It's an enormous region of the sky. It's really quite easy to image. Uh, it's all this this whole thing has a particular name. And then right this little region right here, I don't know if you can see it or not, but if you look carefully, you might be able to see this little region that is denoted as the elephant's trunk nebula. And a lot of astronomers and astrophotographers love, myself included, love imaging this region and exploring it uh, and seeing what uh, different sections within there you can make out. 
And finally, just in this very, very brief introduction, we have the Andromeda galaxy. This is our closest, this is the furthest away thing that you can see with your unaided eye. Uh, it's a relatively straightforward thing to photograph. It's visible above the horizon uh, in the Northern Hemisphere for much of the year. And it's a great target to set your sights on, quite literally. And of course, the book explains how to do this. Here's an interesting quiz um, I might just throw out briefly is, you know, all of these objects um, on the screen are roughly the same size. I'm gonna tip my hand and say this, these planetary nebulae are really, really tiny objects and uh, very, very small when you actually look at them in a, through your camera. This is relatively big. This thing here, the, 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 the width, if you will, of the Andromeda galaxy is about four to five times the size of the full moon. It's huge. It's an enormous object. It's not hard to find in the sky. And once you get it in your camera, you'll be amazed at how striking this object can be. So um, that's really what this theme of this book is about, is to really uh, make these images, these objects, and so many more very accessible to you as a photographer and astronomer. So what I've, one of the things that occurred to me when you're talking about setting up this book is to help make this information accessible to people who are obviously just getting started as a beginner's guide. There's a lot of things I don't know how to do. And if I had a beginner's guide to whatever those things were, I'd appreciate it if the author took some time to help organize things for me so I knew where I could work my way around. So landscape astrophotography, as I mentioned, includes the foreground. And there's a variety of objects you can have in the sky, the Milky Way, the Aurora, the comets, constellations, and so forth. And a classic landscape astrophotography image would include, let's say, the Milky Way with some sort of an interesting foreground that has some special meaning to either you or, or the community at large. This is a single image. I set up my camera, I set up the camera that took this image, put it on a self-timer, ran over to my other camera, I'm a terrible poser, so please be kind. And the camera that I was on the self-timer snapped the shot. I was good to go. You can also produce multi-image blends from a stationary tripod. In this case, both of everything that was shooting the images were stationary. So I call this a an untracked, these are untracked image projects because we're not tracking the night sky. The night sky is moving and we're not trying to account for that. So these are landscape astrophotography um, images, and that's a huge component of the book. But another huge component of the book are what we call deep sky astrophotography objects. And this is where I, one of the things I really think sets this book uh, apart, especially at a beginner level. I don't know of another book um, at a beginner level that covers both of these topics in the print form. So you can see here on the left, we have the emission nebulae, the planetary nebulae, reflection Nebulae, supernova remnants, molecular clouds, galaxies, galaxy clusters, different types of star clusters. Oh man, there's so many things to check out and explore. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And again, you can shoot these just with whatever cameras you have. I mean, these, the image on the left, I think was shot with maybe a 20 millimeter lens. I mean, that, that's a that's a wide angle lens. This one on the right, I think was probably around 50 or 70 millimeters, somewhere in there. Um, the one on the right, of course, is a wide angle lens, 14 millimeters and so forth. But then the other component that I'm sure you've heard about, or if you haven't, you soon will, involves the use of what are called star trackers, or these are little uh, gizmos, if you will, that you mount on your, it's like a motorized ball head that tracks the night sky. So what you do is when you set up the, your star tracker, you set it up in a way that it's, it's basically just a motor, to put it simply, that rotates at the same speed as the earth, but in the opposite direction. So when you mount your camera on a tracker, it stays locked onto the same portion of the sky so you can um, have a much longer exposure. I'll be talking much more about this and all these other topics. This is kind of like a taster session for the in-depth uh, webinar we're, we're gonna be giving in a few weeks on May 9th. And I'll be talking more about how you can join us for that. That's a much more in-depth deep dive into many of these topics. So, but in essence, this really, this, this, this diagram really sort of visually, um, uh, describes the structure of the book in a way that I hope would be useful. So now what I'd like to do is just to allay some of your concerns, because, you know, especially if you're just getting into this, you know, you've all seen the uh, glorious images of, you know, telescopes with wires and computers and people obsessively obsessing about all the things. This is not what this book is. You can shoot astrophotography 
from the heart of downtown. This is downtown Minneapolis. It's one of the brightest places in the country, believe it or not. And here you can easily see the constellation Orion. You can see Orion's belt. You can see Orion's sword. You can see the different stars that make up the uh, constellation artfully nestled between these two really bright signs and all these city lights with snow on the ground, which is a super reflective surface. Here's another example over Duluth, Minnesota, which is another bright city. And this is an example showing star trails that are clearly visible even in the dawn, uh, you know, the coming dawn sky. This is looking more or less east-ish. And uh, again, you can see the star. So this is, you don't need, my point is you don't need to drive out to the deserts of Utah or Namibia or central you know, Australia or any of the dark locations like this to enjoy astrophotography. You can do this from downtown. And look at this one. This was from two nights ago, right down the street from where I live in St. Paul, Minnesota, where there's an enormous aurora display, um, a, a solar storm that if you haven't heard about it, I'm it, do a little Googling on April 23, 2023, Aurora, and you'll have all sorts of stuff. This is right in the middle of the city. I mean, this is, a, I live in a super bright area. And again, uh, the, we were able to see the Aurora and a number of different stars and constellations. So you, you don't have, wherever you are, downtown, in the suburbs, in the rural countryside, or if you happen to live in a dark location, you can do astrophotography. And this book will help you understand how to do that. The other thing I wanted to talk about briefly is equipment. And obviously years ago, this is a, a, a camera, a, a DSLR shot of uh, a scene on the shore of uh, Mono Lake in the Eastern Sierra of California. And in the top scene, this was uh, when the moon was just in the process of setting facing west. You can see one of the students in my workshops doing uh, something with his camera in a red light. And then a few hours later, after the moon had set, we were able to shoot the Milky Way over these beautiful, really Martian looking tufa structures in the uh, in, in Mono Lake. And I say these are with my uh, DSLR, but you can get more or less the same thing with a cell phone. I mean, you couldn't do that five years ago. I mean, look at this. Here's um, a comparison. These were taken within, you know, the top two were taken within a few seconds of each. I think I might've even taken the cell phone shot while the DSLR was exposing. So they might've even been taken at the exact same time. Uh, and again, if, you just, if you're just getting going, you have a cell phone, you live in a city, you are good to go. You don't need to invest in a lot of expensive equipment to get started in astrophotography. All right, so... There's a lot of stuff to see. You can see it from the city. You don't need fancy equipment. How is this book going to help? Well, here's the table of contents. And I just want to briefly go through this. Uh, there are nine chapters, really six, nine minus two is seven, 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 you know, meaningful chapters with an introduction and then a conclusion. So the first chapter really talks about what we've just been talking about. Welcome to astrophotography. What are the different types that you just saw? And what can you do with what you've got? And the answer is a lot. The next chapter, chapter two, in involves understanding the night sky. This is a little bit like Astronomy 101 in a very you know, condensed down, practical, why do I need to use this type of information? And I think it's written in a way that you'll find very, very accessible. And I've got a few resources in the appendices I'll talk about that'll help too. Uh, so you talk navigating the night sky, measuring the night sky, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then we, of course, um, we want to talk about gear. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I was trying to debate, should I put the gear here or at the end? And I decided to leave it here. Uh, so we talk about camera bodies and lenses and accessories and technique, you know, how to focus. Uh, I might even do a quick demo of that a little bit later. And then we talk about, uh, do a deep dive into the particular subjects of landscape astrophotography, you know, um, different types of, you know, philosophy and ethic of, imaging some of the objects we've been talking about, you know, comets, the aurora, eclipses, that sort of thing. And then chapter five really gets into the deep sky astrophotography arena. So um, what you'll see here are, you know, a discussion of some of the top deep sky objects, the nebulae, the star clusters. And again, I got a few resources I want to help uh, share with you today to show you what's what we've got together. I think you'll find really, really helpful. And then um, planning is a big part of astrophotography. I think, by the way, I'm keeping an eye on the chat and the Q&A, and I think what we are planning to do is I'm going to talk here for a bit, and then we're going to save the answers up till the end for a, a good amount of time. So have no fear that I will answer every one of your questions, my favorite part of the talk, to be honest. Uh, so if you have a question and it just comes to your mind, just pop it in the chat or the Q&A, and we will, uh, we will answer it for sure. 
All right. So planning is a huge part of this. And one of the things that you'll find it will kind of um, blow your mind. It kind of amazes me is how powerful the apps and resources, some of the software, the free re resources you can access through your, either your smartphone or your uh, laptop to help you plan your sessions. And then we go through your first astrophotography session and all the things that it can go wrong and how to fix them. So there's a whole <laughs> slew of things that you're going to run into that I've run into. And I think I, 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 if, there's always something more that can go wrong, but uh, you know, getting anticipating them is um, is half the battle. And then finally, of course, we have to have a section uh, on on editing, and we talk about you know Lightroom and Photoshop and PixInsight and Starry Landscape Stacker and Starry Sky Stacker and all the plugins for star removing and yada yada yada. There's all kinds of really cool stuff to uh, use to help take the pain away from the editing of making your astrophotography images look incredible. And if you've got any experience with editing raw images in you know, Lightroom or Photoshop, you know what I'm talking about. You can do some amazing things with that. And then finally, of course, I've just got a few different thoughts that I'm offering of things to consider if you'd like to, if you like this stuff and you want to, you know, go further. So um, there's that. The final section are, we have four appendices. One, a really comprehensive um, table of the top deep sky objects. I want to show you that today if I can. And then the Appendix B is a planisphere uh, template that I put together with uh, uh, a bunch of information that, again, I also think you'll be uh, uh, that you'll find useful. And then Appendix C is a couple of planning templates. And then an Appendix D is a little brief description about how to undertake what are called deepscape projects. All right, so with that, I think I'm looking at the clock and time always passes faster than you think it does. I do want to leave plenty of time for questions, but I would like to just briefly go through just uh, a couple of examples from each of the chapters, just so you get a sense of, of me and my teaching style and the type of information that's um, available. And I'll just go through this kind of quickly. We'll see where we are, and then we'll kind of go from there. So the we've kind of covered the introduction chapter two is introducing the night sky one of the key things with this is okay uh you know i would venture to say that many of us myself included most of us um as rocky nook uh readers um readers of, of rocky nook books are we're photographers and anytime you in you know start going down a new avenue of uh, photography there's a learning curve of, of learning your subject. Like for example, I am not a sports photographer, but I do know, or a wedding photographer, but I do know that people who are really good at wedding photography and really good at sports photography understand the sports and they understand weddings. They know where to be with their cameras, where to stand in anticipation of the events that are about to happen. And that's how they get those amazing shots. They're in, they're already standing there. They've got the lens on, they've got their settings ready to go. They just have to wait for the thing to happen and they can push the button and they are good to go. And it's the same way with night photography. I know that many of the photographers that I've run into in my classes and workshops are, you know, curious about the night sky, but they don't necessarily know a lot about it. And that's what this chapter really wants to uh, help you with. And with that in mind, there is, I've created this, um, what I call a pocket planisphere that I think you'll find useful. And I want to kind of demonstrate that uh, now. So what I'm going to do, or just keep your fingers crossed, everybody. I'm going to, uh, it, it sort of worked, <laughs> but it didn't work with the screen sharing. So uh, hi, everyone, again. Um, so what I've got here is uh, uh, a, a copy of the book that Katie showed you. But in the back of this book, I'm going to just flip over now to the, um, I got the second camera set up. So here's the book, and it's got all sorts of good stuff in here. But at the back of it, um, what you can see here is I've created this, this is Appendix B, and this is this planisphere. I'm going to, I've made a copy of these two pages, and I want to demonstrate how to use these two pages, okay? So what do we have? So I'm going to get this out of the way. And so what these are, I'm going to maybe zoom in a smidge and see if we can uh, make sure that's got a good focus. Okay, so a planisphere, if you're not familiar with them, is a really helpful device for understanding how to uh, navigate your way around the night sky. And I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time with this, but this is just a simple paper cutout, and you can you know, photocopy the appendices and, and cut them out. But this image, or this, this wheel, has all of the constellations and night sky objects 
effective. I zoom really, really in on this a little bit. You can see here, for example, here's the, the constellation Aries. Here's Pegasus, the great square of Pegasus. We can come over here to Ophiuchus. This is that, this is that region of the sky I was just showing you. There's those glorious different colors and things. And then we have the constellation Leo. But if you see here, there's all these different numbers that I've labeled in here. And what those numbers represent are the top 50 deep sky objects that, in my opinion, are worth photographing. I have never seen a planetsphere labeled in this way. So I think this is one of the truly, so if you're not, <laughs> if you want to get this book just for this, I, I think that might be worth it because I think this is an incredibly useful thing because the way you use this is, and I'll be talking much more about this on May 9th, is you can put this together in a way that you can then say, dial in, let's see, what's today? Today's April 24th, 25th, something like that. And so here's April right here. And I'm going to say, let's say it's April 25th at 10 p.m. So I'm going to zoom in on that. So I'm going to put this wheel. So April 25th is at 10 p.m. Those two line up. And what this shows us is everything that's visible in the night sky tonight at 10 p.m. And it shows you if I'm facing east, for example, I'm just seeing the Milky Way. This is yellow band is the Milky Way. I'm just seeing the Milky Way come up over the horizon. On the other hand, if I'm facing west, so I turn it this way around. Um, uh, I think I lost my, there we go. April 25th at 10 p.m. If I'm facing west, on the other hand, in, in fact, I go a little bit earlier, in the, like a week or so ago, you can just see Orion here setting along with Sirius and Gemini. This is the, the winter, the winter um, hexagon. And then all of these different objects are things that I describe in the book that you might want to explore with your camera. And while we're on that subject, let me just show you how that works, is our, the very first appendix is, um, this is appendix A, the top deep sky objects. Let me zoom out of this a little bit. Really got to keep an eye on the clock here. I'm so excited about this. The this, uh, this is the top deep sky objects. I talk about them. And here they are. There's, there's this table that have each one of them, each row is um, an object. And so, for example, you can see there's the Seagull Nebula. It's in this constellation, Canis Major. It's an emission nebula. These are the constant, these are the coordinates, the best date. This column shows the best date for uh, photographing these. And it starts in January and goes through December. The object size, its magnitude, how bright or how dim it is. Then we talk about what recommended lens I use. You can, catch, you can catch it really from a 50 to a 500 millimeter lens. The camera settings to use. And then some uh, comments. That's Mike's. This is Mike's stream of consciousness. Faint but good with H-alpha nebula filters, for example, for that one. So anyway, so that's a lot of information that I think will be, especially when you're getting started, is what are the top 50 objects? And then you can use this planisphere here for how to find them in the night sky. So that was something I really wanted to... Um, talk about. All right. So let's see here. Um, I am going to, I see there's some great, great questions and um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to resist the temptation to uh, uh, thank you for them. Keep them coming by the way. And um, I am going to go back to the presentation here. Oh, I got to share the screen, don't I? Hang on. I'm so sorry. Excuse me. Just one second. I got excited when I saw the questions. Um, so I'm going to share the screen. I'm going to go back to, where is it? Here it is. Okay. Share that. And okay. So here is, so that's the plan is here. That's chapter two. Chapter three is equipment and gear and setting that up. Again, this is all you need, especially, I mean, you really only need your cell phone, but if you have a camera and a lens that has manual focus, as you can see here, and manual exposure and a red headlamp, you are good to go. If tonight's clear, go out and shoot something tonight. I can you know, potentially help with that. So the book talks all about this. It talks all about using star trackers. This is with a wide field uh, setup. This is also with a telephoto setup. And there's a ton of stuff in the gear chapter on accessories, helpful accessories that will help make your nights more productive, um, more enjoyable, safer, and all that sort of stuff. And then there's a little bit on guiding. So if I, when I first, you know, again, got into this, I was sort of, you know, I remember when I was teaching astronomy at the university, 20 years ago, I started getting into guided astro astronomy and guided astrophotography. And you had to use a laptop and all this stuff. And it was like, you had to use download drivers and all this stuff that was just uh, 
not my thing, but today there are a variety of um, accessories that you can get. The ASI Air Pro, these little guide scopes that are just have completely, just like you know, cell phones have revolutionized telephones. These little things have revolutionized guided uh, guided astrophotography. So definitely, it's a whole new era in that. Landscape astrophotography, I've, we've talked briefly about some of the subjects. Um, here's an example of the type of information you'll find. So this is the uh, short piece on aurora photography. And what you can see here is uh, a couple of examples of different lenses. But look at the column on the right. These three, this is, and this is a, an, an example of the type of, um, of my teaching style, if you will. This is the type of thing I like to do is to show these comparisons. And so to do this, I had three cameras set up right next to each other. Uh, we're looking north over a lake into Canada from Minnesota. And I have a 14 millimeter lens on one camera, a 24 millimeter lens on the second camera, and a 70 millimeter lens on the third camera. So I have three different cameras. And as you can see, the, obviously the fields of the angles of view are totally different, but these images are taken at the exact same moment. I mean, you can see the same cloud in each of these three and the reason for showing this is, <laughs> this is my hot Aurora tip. Use a longer lens if you have a dim display, because the Aurora will take up more of the field of view than if you're shooting with the wide angle lens. I mean, here in this wide angle lens, you can see the you know, early spring uh, Milky Way, if you will, the, the end of the winter Milky Way. And the Aurora is there, but it's not very impressive. But with a longer lens, as you can imagine, it's going to fill the frame. All right. So that's a bunch of stuff like that in all the different topics, you know, comets, uh, meteor showers and all that. And then we get into deep sky astrophotography and, you know, how to shoot these types of um, uh, emission nebulae, you know, some of the techniques and the special gear that you might like to use. Um, and then this is an example of a star that exploded many years ago. This is the Veil, Eastern and Western Veil Nebulae, magnificent objects to shoot. And again, this, I think this was a 135 millimeter focal length. I mean, it's, it's certainly not an exotic thing to shoot. Um, Talked about the uh, labeled deep sky object planisphere that I just demonstrated. So you can find this in the appendix, appendix of the book. And by the way, I'll say that you can buy the ebook now and print this out at your, you know, at your at your leisure and and make this literally, you know, uh, by the end of this uh, webinar. Um, and so that's in there. And then I also talk about astro modifying your camera for. Uh, you know, for picking up these types of uh, nebulae. So let me talk briefly. I'm going to do a quick aside on this in case you've heard about astro modifications and different, you know, hydrogen alpha filters. So here's just an example. So a standard camera, I'm not I'm going to keep this quick. Uh, a standard camera, visible light, here's the spectrum. There's a thing called a standard IR filter in front of your sensor. So you see this gray thing. This is all just a schematic that I drew. But this gray thing is your camera sensor. And what the standard IR filter does is it blocks most of the infrared light from what you're looking at so it doesn't overpower the visible light. And if you've ever seen those scenes where this standard IR filter is completely removed and you have like infrared photography and you have these really surrealistic looking images of like trees that have white leaves, that sort of thing. That's, with, that's because of the infrared light that comes through if you take off the standard IR filter. Now, uh, as you can see here, these glowing objects on the right, that's that same image, have a very characteristic color. And that comes from, it's sort of a quasi-infrared light, if you will. And that's partially blocked by this filter, you know, like 60, 70%, which is not great. So one thing you can do is you can replace that standard eye filter with a IR filter with a custom filter that lets that I, that uh, hydrogen alpha light through. And so, if you look very carefully, and to astrophotographers, this is a this is a significant difference. If you look carefully between the left and the right, you can see the image on the right has more pink to it. So our pulses quicken, our hearts beat a little bit faster when we see that because we know that with the right processing, we can do something with that. Now you can see here in this diagram that all the hydrogen alpha light passes. How about this? Now what you can do is you can put in this special lens filter or clip-in filter in front of your in your camera body, and the lens filter blocks everything except the hydrogen alpha light, so that only the hydrogen light passes through the IR filter, and your camera sensor collects all of it. So this is a best case scenario, and that's when you start getting images. These are all just single images on the bottom, by the way, straight off the camera with no processing 
for a straight up comparison. And you can see the enormous difference in um, the nebulosity between the image on the right and the one on the left. So if you're just getting started and you experience these images on the left and it's like, hey, how come I'm not getting images like this? Uh, this is one of the reasons why. So don't despair. This book is coming to the rescue. Finally, we have Deepscape. So this is an example of a deep sky object. Here's the Orion Nebula. Here's Orion's Belt, the Flame Nebula, Horsehead Nebula right here, setting over Mount Whitney in California. You can see a little mountaineer camp right here at the base. And um, Deepscapes are a whole lot of fun to plan. If you, if you Google Deepscapes or you're just learning about Deepscapes, it's a really interesting uh, subject and a lot of fun to explore. Okay, planning. Well, if you know much about my background in recent history in astrophotography, you know that I'm a huge planning person. I have a science engineering type background and it's a little bit of puzzle solving. So if you like this sort of thing, astrophotography is a great way to do it. If you don't, that's fine. You don't need to do it. But this is an example of using one of the apps that's available, Planet Pro, as you can see here in the caption. And what this does is it allows you to simulate an image at any given, from any different, from any, any position. This is from Tunnel View in Yosemite National Park in California. And what this shows is what you will see if you're standing at Tunnel View on October 25th, 2026, so in three and a half years, at 6.12 p.m., with a 500 millimeter lens, you can get this shot. And the precision and the uh, fidelity of the planning process these days is so great that um, it just, like I say, it's just absolutely mind blowing. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that here. I talk about, this is how I planned this shot, again, using Planet Pro. Uh, PhotoPills is another great tool. It doesn't quite have the same uh, simula uh, simulation capabilities, but to capture this shot, this is the, the model that I developed in on the app on my phone uh, to know when to when to travel to Arches National Park, where to stand, and what lens to use to capture this shot. So that's a great part of this. Then I talk about all the things that can go wrong. I mean, it's sort of like you know, there's as you know, as a photographer, there's this image you have in your head, head and how the session's going to go, and then there's, there's reality. And there's so many things that can go wrong. This one on the left is I had this magnificent time lapse. What am I thinking about it in Death Valley? I was facing west. It, can't, the sun, the moon was rising behind me in the east, and I kind of failed to appreciate just how much the <laughs> shadow of my tripod would be in the scene. So it kind of completely ruined the uh, time lapse. But I did get a nice figure for this book out of it. Uh, flares, you know, there's always these like lens. Especially, I'm not great at keeping my lenses clean, so I need to do a better job of that and get these lens flares. And this one on the upper right, this is memorable to me because um, of a great story that goes along with it. But I was shooting this and I got distracted by the story. And somehow I knocked, I had this, I mean, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a reflection of the moon down here in this little puddle of water. Anyway, it was it was just kind of funny because I was so excited about the shot and it was just completely out of focus. Uh, editing. Well, you know, boy, we could just, uh, you know, have a whole thing on editing. But as you know, uh, Lightroom, by the way, Lightroom has just come out with a new denoise feature just within the last week or so that is game changing in the, in the scheme of uh, astrophotography and many other situations because of the high ISO values that we use so often to capture the uh, low light of the scenes. But, you know, go through Lightroom, you know, the different global adjustment tools as they apply to astrophotography. I have to be very targeted with this because I know that you know how to use Lightroom or if you, there are other much better resources in this book to learn uh, Lightroom and uh, Photoshop. We talk about, you know, the different new masking, the AI masking tools in, uh, in Lightroom. I go through some examples of that. Then, of course, talk about layers and, and Photoshop and ways of, you know, creating kind of fun projects. This is an example where I took a, a pair of cheap sunglasses frames on the bottom left and knocked out the lenses um and then just held them in front of my camera and then did a, this is again in death valley love death valley uh did a star trails exposure later the same night without moving the tripod and then in photoshop i stacked them and i removed the middle part of the sun of the sun uh, yeah sunglasses and you could see through that to the underlying star trails <laughs> image so i think it's kind of a fun project anyway so there's that um and then finally i just talk a little bit about you know places you can you take your astrophotography. So uh, this is the, fun, the final chapter in the book. I talked about the top deep sky astrophoto astrophotography targets in the northern and the southern, the top 50 in the northern hemisphere, 
and then an additional 10 in the southern hemisphere because so many of these are visible in both hemispheres uh i mentioned the the planetsphere that i i think is a, a very a, not something is either unique or it's not so it's as it's a, it's a unique feature of the book and then i have these templates for planning your astrophotography and then uh finally the appendix on deepscapes so you know here we are uh we're going to blast off into space with our astrophotography we're counting down the final moments it's getting dark we're about to launch here we go heading off into space with our camera again we see the milky way all the beautiful things the nebulae the star clusters that we can enjoy with our camera enjoy with our uh you know just visually observing it and you know one big feature this is also an image from the book is that we on earth are all astronauts we don't really need to go into space to see what does astronauts see. The image on the right is from the International, uh, I'm sorry, from the Space Shuttle from many years ago. There was a couple other examples from the International Space Station in the book and a corresponding image uh, from the California High Sierra on a workshop with some friends. And we see the same thing. I mean, you don't need to go into space to be an astronaut. So, you know, I keep jumping. I keep trying to get up there um i've got this astronaut suit i just you know my i guess my camera is my uh is my spaceship but uh I, i'm gonna keep trying and you're welcome to join me so again if you haven't uh yet purchased the book um here's your chance to do that this is a qr code if you scan this with your camera this will take you to the rocky nook website like katie mentioned um i think she mentioned a coupon code she'll be talking about that so just bookmark that and the other thing i did want to um urge you to consider joining me is in a, at the beginning of of may may 9th there is we're going to be putting on a two-hour um webinar with rocky nook on astrophotography there's much more detail oriented and you know how do you do this how do you shoot the moon how do you shoot meteor showers how do you shoot nebulae you know how do you set up your camera to, how do you focus you know what's a can you give me an example of how to focus and stuff like that very practical sort of hands-on excuse me uh webinar so i'd urge you to consider uh, registering for this this is going to be recorded so even if you can't join us on on the date uh it's an uh, with all <laughs> I, I with all humility I, I might suggest that this is a screaming deal especially with the early bird um 50 i mean 50 dollars for a two-hour webinar on this stuff is uh, i think you'll find it incredibly useful especially once it'll get to go along with the book so please consider joining us for that that's in as i say in a few weeks and you'll be seeing sort of an expanded in-depth version of uh of this material and then finally just if you want to know a little bit more about me this is my website um and if it's just mikeshawphotography.com if the qr codes aren't working for you uh, but yeah i've got a whole bunch of stuff here on different classes and workshops and stuff like that and including this book so thank you um these are the social links for Rocky Nook, if you're not already following Rocky Nook, uh, now's a good time to do that. And then myself on Instagram, it's the same thing on Facebook, and then on Twitter. So I think with that, I will stop sharing. And oh, I have to switch. Whoops. Uh oh. My, oh, my camera turned off. I'm going to um, turn my camera back on. Uh, hang on just one second. But then, Katie, maybe you can queue up a few questions. So I'll be able to. Yeah, we have a great number of questions in chat and Q&A. And first off, I just want to say thank you, Mike. That was uh, really informative and beautiful to see. Um, and I'm really eager to get to some of the questions that people have asked. Um, we have a number of participants who are joining us. Uh, England, Czech Republic, Alberta, Calgary, uh, Atlanta, Georgia, Hawaii, South Texas. So thank you all for uh, participating and being with us today. Um, one of the first questions uh, I have, Mike, is that we just had one of our yearly meteor showers. And I was curious if you could tell us what causes the meteor showers and how do they happen at the same time every year in the same sort of season of meteor showers? They do. I'm going to, uh, I might be switching my cameras around here in a, 
uh, briefly. Sorry about that. Something decided to go wrong with the other uh, camera. But in a nutshell, what happens with meteor showers is that the um, meteor showers happen because of a very specific thing. There is a I'm gonna zoom out on this. Maybe use the book as a as a as a assist here. And the meteors are they're also you know colloquially referred to as shooting stars. Um, happen when a small Inter an interstellar particle of dust slams into the uh, into the uh, into the Earth's atmosphere, and so here's an example. I don't know if you can see this or not, but this is a meteor shower where you have a bunch of meteors coming in all at the same time, and this uh, table in the book shows the different uh, meteor showers in terms of their how many meteors you're likely to see in an hour. And so the one that just happened, the Lyrids, only really has about 20 meteors per hour, best case, whereas the Geminids and the Perseids are up over 100 meteors per hour. So that's one of the reasons those are so much more, um, so much more popular, if you will. But uh, in terms of the... Uh, so in, in essence, what happens is... So meteors happen whenever an object hits the Earth's atmosphere, um, period. But what happens with meteor showers is that you have a comet or an asteroid that will, as it, as it orbits the sun, will actually leave behind in its orbit a trail of dust. And when the Earth passes through one of these comet dust tails, we have tons and tons of an unusually high frequency of meteors, but it only lasts for, usually for a, maybe a few hours or maybe a few days. So this is the or this is but it happens on ex, very reproducibly at the same time of year uh, because of that. Um, so I'm going to go back over and see if I can get my other camera to uh, <laughs> start working. And if it doesn't, I'm going to flip over to this camera so we can um, we can have a better chance with that. So uh, what's so hopefully I was able to answer that question. Yes, thank you. Um, we have another question, which I think is our good question to go to next. It's from Conrad. And Conrad has purchased uh, one of your first books, The Complete Guide to Landscape Astrophotography. And he wants to know uh, what would be the difference between that book that was published in 2017 uh, versus this book that's been oh, published that's in 2023. Okay. Um, let me just finish. I have an idea, and I think it might have to do with versus landscape photography and deep sky but i'm going to let mike answer that yeah no that's i mean that is um exactly it i'm so sorry about this uh can you hear me okay Katie? we don't hear you very well you sound uh you sound like you're in a tunnel okay um let's try that all right um let's see here stand by Okay, we're back in business. It was a slight power issue. Um, yes, okay. So, hey, Conrad, how are you? So the big difference is the emphasis on deep sky work along with tracking, along with the um, the guiding and the deep sky and the advances in processing the AI masks and then the, um, you know, the star removal uh, type tools and all that sort of stuff. That book came out in 2017. I actually wrote it in 2015. And if you think about your cell phone in 2015 versus your cell phone in 2023, there's just been an improvement in what people do, as well as um, the, the the breadth of the of the book. So I think there's enough in there to make it worthwhile. Okay. If I next... say so, yeah. Our next question comes from Benjamin. And Benjamin asks, how do you determine an, an initial exposure time and, and then recommended ISO? Oh, that's a great question. Okay, so uh, for that one, I'm gonna go to page 64 in the book, if you happen to have one, have that handy. And what I've got here is a list of, you know, I'll zoom in on this. So these are the recommended exposure settings for common landscape astrophotography. Target. So you can see here, uh, for example, 
what lens to use over here, the ISO, the f-stop, the shutter speed. Um, oh, and this is for, by the way, this is something else that's a little bit different. Um, well, actually, totally different, is I have settings for if you live in the city, if you live in the, in the sub suburbs, or if you're in a dark sky spot. And so you have city uh, settings, rural settings, and dark sky settings. So three completely different set of settings depending on where you are. So that's for the um, landscape astrophotography. And as I mentioned, the uh, the table back here has all the settings for the um, for the deep sky thing. So a lot of these tend to be fairly similar, but there's some of these are are quite different. So it's 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 really all in there. We tried to do as, as good as as comprehensive a job as we can so that you can be successful right when you start um, start shooting. Um, Thomas has a question for advice. Do you have advice for keeping light from your red headlamp here um, from getting into the image? Standing behind and to the side of my tripod, I still manage to capture some of the red light aura in the sides of the image. Great question. You have to turn it off, really. And it's the the solution is as you know, this is this is my advice as because I, I teach these workshops and this comes up all the time. Your camera is so sensitive and your exposures are so long and the ISO is so high and the aperture is wide open that you're, if the, even if you're facing the other direction, you're inevitably going to end up with a tiny little bit of, 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 of light if you keep it on uh, during, the, during the exposure at all. It's, my advice is honestly is with a little bit of practice, I'm, I'm holding this like it's my camera, it's a microphone. Um, the, once you start to get to know your camera by feel, it, it opens up whole new doors. So you can figure out how to change the shutter speed, the aperture, the ISO, maybe the focus, um, you know, that sort of thing. And then you can just leave your headlight off. Once you, if you, once you get into the habit of turning your headlight off and keeping it off, you'd be surprised at how much, um, how much you can actually do just by feel. It takes a little while. It's a little frustrating at first, very frustrating at first. What am I saying? but the benefits are, are manifest in getting rid of this effect that you're talking about. If you have a killer image with a little bit of red light, and you can't go back and re redo it, re uh, reproduce it, you can always go into Lightroom or Photoshop, go to the red channel and desaturate it with a little mask and that'll get rid of the red glow locally. Uh, that's another way to fix that. Great. Uh, David asks, is there an online interactive planner as an alternative to cutting out the paper planisphere from the book. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, um, not with the one that's labeled. The, well, actually there is. And let me demonstrate that for you right now. It's called Stellarium. And Katie, do I have time for this or is this? Of course, okay. please demonstrate. Okay, so um, it's uh, this is a free program. Um, it's gonna take me a moment to open it up and everything. But this is a free, it's a great, free um, program called Stellarium that uh, is available for you to do this. And it's a virtual, it's a really, it's a virtual planetarium. And so uh, this is all simulated, of course, and you can move this around. Um, I'm just going to do a couple things real quick here. So what you can do with Planisphere is essentially, it's like I say, it's a virtual a planetarium. So you can zoom in, you can zoom out. I'm zooming out here. You can see the sun there. And it tells me that I'm on Earth in St. Paul, Minnesota, which is where I am. You can change the location to anywhere on Earth that you choose through this uh, window here. You can specify, that's where I, uh, this thing, so I don't know why I think since St. Paul is up there. That's wrong, obviously. But you can pick a, you can pick from this list of cities anywhere in the world and place your viewing point from that location. And then through this window, you can change the time. So you can say, for example, let's suppose that I'm you know, facing roughly west and, um, whoops, I wanna see what, what, what do I see when the sun sets? Well, right now, again, here's, let's put in the constellation line so you can see it a little bit better. Here's the constellation Orion. Here's the moon, it's right next to Mars tonight. Here's Capella, here's Venus. Uh, if you are really interested, you can label the different constellations so you know what you're looking at. You can draw in the art, <laughs> which is always really cool. Uh, one of my favorite ones to uh, um, look for, I'll let you find it, is uh, cancer. And if you find cancer, uh, the crab, 
uh, and you look at the artwork and then you look at the constellation, you have to ask what sort of feverish imagination was it to produce that. But this is a really good planet because then you can say to yourself, okay, well, clearly, um, if I wanted to be photographing Orion, this isn't the best time of year to do that. But if I go around here to the southeast and I wait a few hours till, you know, just, whoops, um, keep doing that, till just after midnight, then look what starts showing up in the southeast. Oh, that's two in the morning, I guess. Um, and here comes the Milky Way. And then, of course, you can start zooming in on this, and you can start finding some of these really cool objects that you might want to start exploring. What's that? What's that? What's that? There's all these things to find. Oh, my gosh, it just never ends. So Stellarium is another good um, planning tool that you can use to get. And this, and, and it has a built-in repertoire of, uh, of, of, of information on each object. Great. That's a wonderful demonstration. It's so fun. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, you spend hours doing that. Um, Steve wants to know about solar photography, uh, Coronado mm -hmm. telescopes. Yeah, uh, don't have one. I've Library. used them at different places and they work well. I don't have a lot of experience with them, so I'm going to uh, respectfully pass on that. Um, I'm not a, a solar scope expert by any means, so I would defer to someone who is. But um, they're not expensive. The sun's, <laughs> it's, just, it's a really bright star. And I mean, right now there's, I mean, we're peaking, we're, you know, getting close to the peak of the uh, current 11-year solar cycle. It's one of the reasons we had this raging uh, aurora a few days ago and then one back in March. And so this would be a really good time to uh, get a solar scope, especially with the upcoming um, solar eclipse. And on that note, let me just say as a note of caution uh, to anyone um, listening, if you do observe the solar eclipse, you have to use a certified solar filter, not a neutral density filter, certainly not sunglasses, because you'll go blind and you'll wreck your camera. Um, but there's plenty of resources out there for uh, getting actual solar filters, as described in the book um, that we're talking about. Uh, Danelle has this question. Maybe you can interpret this. She asks, will the standard R72 IR screw-on help capture the nebula H red light in the sky? I think the answer is an enthusiastic thumbs up. Okay. And uh, I don't know if you have a... If, if, if you have an astro modified uh, camera, not if that's what you're talking about, but the best way to find out is to give it a try, honestly. And right now I would start off with the North American Nebula in the early morning hours, the Lagoon Nebula in, uh, uh, in, the, um, in the Milky Way has two relatively bright targets to see if you could help make out the difference. And I think you'll be very, very uh, happy with what you see. Okay, uh, RG asks, where do you get that Earth model on the table inside the celestial sphere? <laughs> you mean, the, the, oh no, the, let me grab that for you. Um, this is a great tool. And so this, uh, I know this is out of focus, but the nice thing about this is that the Earth spins independently of the stars. And it's a great way of visualizing you know, and explaining when I'm giving, you know, public astronomy programs and astrophotography talks in general, uh, how the night sky motion occurs and how, why the white Polaris, I mean, just for people who are just getting started, but I just, it was a scientific, uh, a science, uh, a science resource. I can't remember the name of the place, but uh, if you, it's, it's called a celestial sphere and uh, it was around a hundred dollars or something like that. So it's not too bad. Okay. Um, Sean wants to know, do you primarily shoot prime lenses? Great question, Sean. No, I don't, except when I want to use a fast lens. So Sean's question really refers to, I mean, these days in terms of image sharpness, I can't tell the difference between a prime lens and a good quality zoom lens. I mean, they're both really sharp and there's that. The big advantage you get with a prime lens is you can have a much larger opening uh, in the, for, for the aperture. Can't really, I mean, the best zoom lenses, I think are has a minimum aperture of F2.8, a minimum f-stop of F2.8, maximum aperture of F2.8. And the best, uh, you know, the fastest zoom lenses go down to F1.2. I mean, maybe even like, I think there's a, I can't remember the manufacturer of a, but it's just like F.9, 0 0.9. And so you get these enormous apertures. You wouldn't actually shoot at those apertures, but if you stop down two stops, then you're shooting at F2.8, let's say. Um, but a much sharper overall image with less distortion around the edges than if you have a, you know, a zoom lens with a minimum aperture of f2.8. So there's a big improvement there. I was kind of a, 
a slow convert, but I've, I've since acquired some uh, fast prime lenses and they do make a difference, especially for so the deep sky objects and for things like the Aurora and meteor showers. So I can, I can recommend them if you're, if you're thinking about it, I'd say, yeah, it's, it's worthwhile. I would probably, well, depending on what your area of interest is, I might start with a, a, a wide, like a Sigma 20 millimeter um, F, I think it's 1.8 to see if, how you like that. Um, or some of the uh, prime lenses from the camera manufacturers. Thomas asks, could you comment on your focusing technique for initial focus at setup? Yeah, I'm going to demonstrate it. Thank you for that. All right. So uh, let me tell you, Katie, how are we doing with time? We're good. We still have about 10 minutes. Oh, okay. So um, I'm going to give you my story about Amy, my friend Amy. It's actually my wife's friend. Amy is a physician. If many of you are watching this, if you've seen me talk, you might've heard the story. Amy and her physician friends go to Australia. They are capable, smart, with it people. They go to Australia, they're in Sydney, they're getting their rental van. And the person about who's about to, the, the dealer at the van is, is holding the key out like this to Amy. And she's reaching out to grab him. And then he pulls him back and says, ladies, repeat after me, diesel, diesel, diesel. The idea being that he wants to make sure they are aware of the fact that it's a diesel vehicle and not to put unleaded gas into it. And so um, the uh, uh, moral of that story is when it comes to focusing in astrophotography, it's focus, focus, focus. You can't check your focus uh, too often. And so how do I do it? Okay, this is how I do it. I'm going to show you with this example. So here is your typical setup. I'm going to pretend that these are actual stars in the sky, okay? And I wanna focus on them. So what I don't do is I don't zoom in on them with my lens, but what I do do is I use the LCD's you know, screen to focus in on the stars like this. And then I find, um, I can't move the book around, so I have to find a, a bright star. Let's find uh, Betelgeuse here. Here it comes, oh, there it is. Okay, so now we've got a bright star. And this is, this is one of the most, I didn't know if we'd have time to do this, but this is often how they'll appear when you first see it. And it's like, that's a bummer. And then you, if you focus on it like that, or like that, that you might think that's good enough. In astrophotography, let me give you a hot tip. I would actually, when you, if it starts off being out of focus, I would focus on it and then keep going and then come back and then keep going. So you're going back and forth like this. Um, and eventually what happens is the reason for that is that stars are flickering because of the atmosphere. And if you try to focus on the star, it's almost impossible because it's going kind of in and out of focus. But if you kind of focus in and out a few times, your, your brain kind of averages all that out and settles on it. The nice thing about this is let's suppose that Betelgeuse is over here, but the thing you want to shoot is over there. It's no problem. Once you focus it on the night sky, if you don't touch your focus ring, you can focus anywhere. You don't have to refocus when you compose your scene. So I'll generally, when I get out for a session, I'll, I'll go out, I'll get a focus and then figure out what I'm going to shoot then compose it and shoot it without refocusing. Focus, focus, focus. <laughs> um, someone from New Mexico would love to know a good spot to recommend. We recommend seeing the eclipse mm. in October. That's a tough one. I mean, what I would recommend honestly is to view the eclipse, get view the eclipse path along the view the you know zoom in on the eclipse path and uh, find a spot. There's a lot of public lands in New Mexico in the path of the eclipse. So I think you would be um, it would it won't be too hard to find a spot where you can set up and shoot it. Um, I'm going to be running a workshop that is run under a special permit at Chaco Culture National Historical Monument. So it's very limited in the uh, number of people that can come on that particular workshop. But um, there's the Bistai de Natsin Wilderness. That would be a great place to go personally. That would be my another runner up. Uh, but there's a bunch of places you'll be able to find in terms of just capturing it as well. Okay. If, and by the way, if you want to, sorry, if you want to look at what the workshop I'll be running, it's on my website and you can get a sense of, of the sort of the information there. It is sold out and waitlisted, but there it is. And I can, uh, I can put a link to your website in the chat. Um, Alan 
asks, is it possible to shoot astrophotography using a tethered setup? It is. Uh, it's So the tethering refers to you have your camera over there, you have a cable running to a laptop, if I understand that correctly. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's very possible. In fact, that's how people used to do it. Um, my preference is I tend to be a very mobile, I go out with my backpack and my camera and I hike around and shoot different things. And I, you know, do a bunch of different uh, variety of projects on any given night. And um, the, uh, you know, so tethering is kind of uh, not geared toward that. <laughs> Excuse me. But if you're so inclined, um, very much so. I mean, you can set up um, and do that. I will say that today with the wireless um, capabilities of the ASI Air system in particular, you really don't need to do that. And it does free you up considerably. I know that a lot of people, especially in Minnesota, where it's freezing half the year, will set their rig up out there. They'll go back in their car and crawl in their sleeping bag on their iPad. Um, I've never done that. And uh, then just do their thing um, and then control the camera without actually having to be out there uh, tethered to it. So there's really a variety of different options for what you want to do. Um, I do have another question on focusing, and I don't know if this was answered in your last uh, story, but Jeff asks, can a field monitor make a difference when focusing? Definitely so. I was going to show you my loop, but I, I I lost it. And this is one of the other things that happens. Uh, everything in uh, photography is generally a, a black color, a black plastic color. And that's awful because when you drop things in the grass, they don't make any sound and you don't know you drop them because they're black. So um, yes, I would recommend a loop. And uh, what is a loop? Let me find a loop to show you. So a loop is basically a magnifying glass for your just LCD screen. Your camera and... has gone off, Mike. Oh, that's no good. Oh, I think that battery. Oh, hang on a sec. There we go. Thank you. Um, so uh, let's see if I have that. So that would be... Let's see if I can zoom in on this. So I don't know if you can see that, but um, this is a handheld loop that you basically hold against the screen of your camera, and it allows you. It doesn't magnify. It's like a. It's like a. Um, it's like a macro lens in the sense that it doesn't magnify things per se, but it just lets you focus on things that are very close to you. So that, in effect, has a, a magnify, magnification, magnifying effect. And so, yeah, I highly recommend getting a loop. I need to get a replacement. And by the way, if you go to my website, um, mikeshawphotography.com, there's a section, there's a top level menu called um, more. And if you go to that tab, about second or third one down, there's something called shop night photography gear. And in that is a website where I put all these things with links so you can buy them. Uh, and I know there's a loop link there. So if you're looking for one that I would recommend, I would go there as a starting point. Great. Um, that's it for questions. We are at time. Oh, well done. <laughs> well done, <laughs> sir. Um, thank you again so much, uh, audience. You were excellent participants. We loved your questions. Um, thank you for joining us. And Mike, thank you for giving us this book. Thank you, uh, Rocky Nook, for uh, publishing this book. And I just want to say once again how grateful I am to Rocky Nook for doing this. This was a long project in the uh, making, and I just, I, I, I'm just thrilled and honored uh, uh, that we're actually uh, this thing is in my hand right now. So um, I think you'll really find this helpful. It's easy to read. It's really the essence of what you need to get going. And drop me a line. Uh, my email is mike at mikeshawphotography.com. Um, and love to hear from you. And again, thanks so much, Rocky Nook, for organizing this event for the one in May. Sign up for that one. And maybe I'll see you out under the stars some night. All right. Uh, thank you so much. And we look forward to hearing from you. And if you have any questions, again, please email us or you email Mike. Uh, his link to his website is in the chat, as are the links to his masterclass and to his book. So take care and have a great day.